Hello. My name is Jerry Petroff. I am a professor at the College of New Jersey and the executive director of the, the, the College of New Jersey's Center for Sensory and Complex Disabilities. Today, I have been um, prepared to speak to you about Deaf Blindness 2.1. We're setting the stage for deeper understandings. This is an overview of deaf blindness, not a intricate um, and detailed uh, presentation, but one that will give you an overview of, of deaf blindness as we view it today. So I want to begin with asking you all to look at this picture. This is a classic picture from an experiment. Uh, done many years ago. Um, and I have my first question to you is, what kind of animal do you see? Looking at two of these figures, if you can make sense of both figures at once, what did you see first? Can you see both images as the same figure? Can you see them as different figures at the same time? Imagine the duck is eating the rabbit. Now, can you see them as different figures at the same time? I'm sure that some of you uh, were more successful than others in going through that simple experiment of viewing. Um, each one of you or many of you had different views or different perceptions. This is a well-known replication study regarding perception or how a simple cue can just influence or clarify our perceptions. So what does that have to do with deaf blindness? Well, the purposes of this introduction to deaf blindness was to illustrate that one's perception of a child with deaf blindness must be open to the hidden cues of their capabilities and their needs. So over the next 60 minutes, let's explore the understandings, places and conditions that can discover and create the keys to both parenting and educating children with deaf blindness. Once again, this is an overview. We're gonna go through five different sections uh, in setting this stage. The first will be an introduction to the regular lives of children with deaf blindness. The second is the role of the sensory system, the impact of sensory loss in children identified as deaf blindness. Then, we're going to go back and define and identify the diversity of deaf blindness. Um, from there, we're going to look at some critical understandings and considerations. And then at the end, we'll review beliefs and assumptions regarding educating children with deaf blindness. Throughout this presentation, I will present you with, with, um, with videos of parents giving their perspective of exactly how they felt uh, about the progress of their children, et cetera, um, et cetera. So let's start out with the regular lives. I say it's not about what you can't do. It's all about what you can do if you're given the right supports in an environment. But the, that goes for everyone, doesn't it? Well, I want to give you um, examples of three students, Jack, Karen, and Tony, three students that I know, um, and how each one illustrates a specific, uh, a specific understanding or position or, or assumption that needs to be made in order for our deafblind children to, to continue. So Jack, Jack is 20 year old youth with deaf blindness who entered school at the age of three and was faced with educators and others that viewed him as incapable of communicating effectively or learning typical school content or subjects. He became withdrawn. He showed little interest in interacting with his peers and demonstrated a wide range of, of challenging behaviors. However, 
His parents and those who understood deaf blindness insisted that with appropriate access to information and tactile sign language, Jack would be able to develop skills of communication and be able to learn. With the proper amount of support from his parents and others, Jack learned to communicate through tactile sign language and is currently in college studying the liberal arts. Second person, Karen. So Karen is a Karen was a little six-year-old girl when I first met her. Um, uh, she was a little girl with deaf blindness and, uh, in which others could not determine if she was progressing or understanding the array of tactile symbols and objects that were consistently presented to her. No one knew if she would develop skills of communication and language and understanding of others or not. However, since it's not known either way, the school team and family proceeded to input communication from tactile and object cues to basic keyword sign, sign language. Today, at age 12, Karen uses a combination of two or three word sign approximations and maintains the use of a calendar system to determine her daily and weekly schedule, daily weekly schedule. Um, she is uh, actively involved in interacting with others, peers who are not deafblind, um, and attends her, uh, a program in her general education um, classroom uh, or the school she would have gone to if she didn't ha have deaf blindness. Then there was Tony. Um, he was a 16-year-old uh, deafblind adolescent who had a team of educators, therapists, and families that believed in his full inclusion into the school, community, and family. He was educated with his typical hearing and sighted peers from preschool to high school. Although Tony communicates through a variety of alternative communication avenues, such as uh, augmentative communication, picture cues, uh, touch touch cues, and other, he continues to learn and grow with his peers. Tony's program content is modified. Um, however, he's learning every, what everyone else is, and every effort is provided to assure that he is included and successful. And from my vantage point, he's very he's been very, very successful. So what do these illustrate? Well, three important um, important concepts. One was with uh, Jack. They had a growth mindset. Families developed a growth mindset, not a fixed mindset that this is the only thing that Jack could do, but uh, developed uh, a growth mindset by educating themselves and others as well. The child was viewed as purposeful and capable. Then there's the least dangerous assumption, which was illustrated by Karen. It was assumed that, that Karen was capable of developing and learning, since there was no evidence to the contrary. Um, and so she did. We don't know that Karen understand, understood or not then, so we assume that, sh that she did. In other words, the dangerous assumption is assuming if somebody doesn't understand or is not capable and really is. And if you don't know, you'd better do the least dangerous assumption. The third is access and opportunity. The child was given the opportunity to be integrated into their family and school. And the child uh, who was Tony was given age appropriate access to the family, school and community, and every effort was made to prevent exclusion. So many deafblind children are, are not provided with the, the quality or quantity of education um, within their typical schools, like schools for the deaf or programs for, for the blind or, or just their typical um, uh, local elementary schools or, or, um, or middle schools or, or high schools. These are the necessary approaches to viewing and educating any child, regardless of their abilities. And for deafblind children, it's paramount to believe. 
So let's move on to our um, our third section, right? And that is the role um, of, or I think this is our second, right? Uh, the role of the sensory system. Um, it's an in, the impact that sensory loss has in children um, who are identified as deaf blindness. Um, those of those of us who understand and work with children with deaf blindness know that the sensory system is more than just hearing and vision. We understand that the key to human growth and development is rooted in the manner in which our senses find find the things around in the world that we need to know. St. Thomas Aquinas said, or stated actually, that the senses are a kind of reason, taste, touch, and smell, hearing, and seeing are not merely a means to sensation, enjoyable or otherwise, but they're also a means to knowledge and are indeed your only actual means to knowledge. He's a very bright man um, that uh, teachers and parents need to understand and know um, we don't have time to explore the intricacies of our brain and its sensory connections. However, let's highlight the most important understandings and knowledge that it would be important to you. Or in other words, what teachers and parents of children with deaf blindness really need to understand and know in regards to how the set human sensory system uh, enables us to learn and grow and develop. So how do humans receive and digest information and gain perspectives of their world? How do they experience the world and their your environment? How do you learn? How do you gain knowledge? How do you gather information that hasn't been taught to you? The answering of these questions were uh, questions are critical to the deafblind child. These questions are so critical to the role of teachers and parents of deafblind children that we will spend a few minutes um, exploring the big ideas that and understandings that come from the sensory world. Life is a sensory experience. We have 100 billion nerve cells that communicate with each other um, through a network of pathways. This elaborate neural pathway system is referred to as the human nervous system. Looks something like this. Nerves are tiny parts of your body that act as messengers. They send signals to your brain. Together, the many parts inside our body that sense what is around us are called the nervous system, in which our sense organs are the major part. Our sense organs, our skin, for touch, our eyes for seeing, our he ears for hearing. Our sense organs work together, not separately, to form our human sensory system, which is key. Seems a little complicated, um, complicated, and you bet it probably is. And yet, us remarkable human beings use our individual abilities to sense the world and make sense of the world. Here's what it would look like. Uh, it's an extension of our brain as it's illustrated here. However, um, th this is a pretty complex view of the neurological sensory system, system that we will not go into in depth in terms of uh, the, the way they work or, or the neurology behind it. Uh, if we did do that, I would be saying, yikes, right? This is difficult to understand. Let's pull out of it what we do know and, and look at it at, at large. Um, information is gathered through our sensory system that informs our brain to interpret what we feel and sense that's referred to as sensory perception. So in other words, our sense organs, our touch, our skin, right? Our hearing, our vision, our movement, um, and other work together to experience the world and send signals to our brain in which is interpreted, uh, interpret each of these things. They make sense of them. In the perfect world, all our sense organs are intact, and therefore the brain has a way of 
getting used to learning, okay, I'll take this piece, that piece, this piece, getting more information from, from this area. However, every one of us has a different way in which we are sensing. Some of us are sensitive to, to auditory input. Some of us are sensitive or not to visual input. Some of us don't um, have very sensitive touch. All of these play, play in the fact the way our bodies, our brain, um, and our sensory system um, interprets sensory uh, information called sensory perception. So um, these are the stages of sensory perception. So let me kind of review it with you as you look at these stages. A child with deaf blindness must, must often be provided a way to know that things and people exist in the world. If they can't see you or hear you, or you're not in close proximity, then it's difficult. A child who cannot see an interesting object from across the room and will not know it's there and therefore must be provided access. Once access is provided, such as given a soft stuffed animal, um, he or she can compare it to the other objects that they have experienced in the past. They make meaning from this experience based on their previous experience. So if a child has felt the pleasure of a soft stuffed animal on their face or in their hands, they will repeat it with the new toy animal and then will remember this experience for future use. They build on their understandings. However, sighted and hearing children have multiple opportunities to experience this chain of events, which further assists in their developing of a concept such as soft stuffed animals. Deafblind children must be provided the same practice and experience. In there lies our charge. If we do not set up opportunities in the environment for deafblind children to have access other than vision and hearing, they are not going to gain knowledge, understandings, or concept development, or any uh, or, or even language at that in in that in, even language possibility. So. Let's look at just visual and auditory perception, which is seems to be the basis of um, of learning in schools in, in particular, and which is why it's important for intervention to occur from people who understand and know deafblind uh, children. Um, as you can see from this diagram, rehearsal and repeated experience use memory to further develop a perception. We steal our deafblind children's memory, is what my mentor, Dr. Jan van Dijk, used to tell me. If, if we don't allow them to rehearse, repeat, and compare every experience that they have, they will not progress in learning. They, we will steal those memories not to be used for the future. If they are not rehearsed, repeated, and compared, therefore, to solidly learn through perception for deafblind children, we must maintain deliberate and frequent documented experiences. These can be in the form of tactile memory books or picture memory books and videos, which we will touch upon in another webinar um, uh, in the future, um, but also a little bit later on in this presentation. Um, I can give you an analogy of my own children. Um, even as young adults, they come, um, they come to our home and they take the picture books from vacations that we have met from the past. And both of them sit together and go through those books to, um, to remember back uh, the time they were young and we were in Thailand or the time we were in Disney World. And they rehearse that. And they've been doing that since they were very little, very little. We need to do the same thing with our deafblind children, but it'll even be more deliberate about it. So another thing we need to understand um, about the sensory system and the hu and humanity, right, is the extraordinary powers of our brain and our sensory system. Um, 
Powers must be underscored, these powers. Considering these facts, you can easily understand that elements of teaching or assisting in development of a child with deaf blindness is essential. Not prepared to, if, if they're not prepared to perceive the world while under stress, they're not gonna learn. And for many children with deaf blindness, going through the world is um, sometimes an unsafe experience, sometimes an emotional experience. And um, there's sometimes little to be motivated about because they don't see and hear uh, the, the world around them. So we must bring it to them. Um, often are not deafblind kids are not provided the same access to multiple opportunities to experience their environment. We inver inadvertently synchronize our movements with others. These are called mirror neurons. They enable us to synchronize our movements with others that we see or we hear. Consider the yawn. If I yawned right now, many of you out there would do the same thing. Right across from just viewing this video, you would be stimulated um, through our connective mirror neurons to yawn. So, it's mandatory to augment the deafblind child's orientation to include tactile and other senses. Consider these understandings from the view of a deafblind child, right? Um, and this is our challenge of solving uh, ways in which we can, um, we can provide and understand these conditions. Now, we may want to take a very simplistic view of the components of the human syst sensory system. And again, I say this is very, um, uh, this is a very simplistic view, but one that maybe we can, um, we can learn from. There are seven most commonly identified components of the sensory system. Um, we typically pull them out. Um, we take our vision out and give it to the teacher of the blind. We take our hearing out and we give it to the teachers of um, the deaf. Uh, we, um, we do things, sensory stimulation, where we put smelly things in front of kids' noses. We, um, we try different tastes. We try different movement. We take physical therapy out and we try um, to work on the kids that way. And then we stand back and say, put this all together. Well, it doesn't really work that way. Um, they each play a vital role in human development and learning. However, seeing and hearing are the distant senses and obtain ref often referred to as the primary learning channels, which are further supported and developed by the other senses. The other senses are often referred to as the proximate senses or the near senses. Now, just because st our students don't see or hear well, or maybe even have difficulty with balance or, or other, other sensory experiences, doesn't mean they can't learn. It just means that we must take this into consideration and and utilize ways in which we can provide a sensory experience for learning. So here are the distance senses, the seeing and hearing. Let's, let's look what we know about this human sensory system now. Well, there are multiple sensory networks that work collaboratively. They all work together, not separately. Yet sometimes we just want to pull it out, pull each of those senses out. Um, and they're all directed by the brain. Each of these uh, networks uh, have an important role in every child's development. Why? Well, because the majority, if not all information is presented, um, is presented visually and auditorily. So it is a big issue for kids with deaf blindness. So if we look at motor, social, social um, emotional status, sensory status, uh, communication and learning cognition, we really uh, take a look at the fact that it is reported that 70 and 80% of what we learn, at least in schools, is derived from our vision. Hmm, that poses a problem, a problem for us who are who have deaf, kids with deaf blindness, but it shouldn't. It should pose a challenge. 
How much information do we gather from each sense in the same amount of time as compared to others? Well, there's some new findings that say these things. 85, 83% vision, 11% um, uh, hearing, 3.5% smell, et cetera, et cetera. What do we do with this information? Well, one thing we don't do is come to any conclusion that the deafblind child cannot learn, but rather we must change or augment our approaches to match the child's strengths. Um, most parents really want their kids to speak or to see or to hear, and I get that. However, we must look at how the sensory system works in collaboration with each other and what strengths your individual child or each individual child has. The overall distance senses of vision and hearing do play a critical role in the overall human development and learning process of most children. So we ask ourselves, in what ways does vision and hearing play a critical role to development and learning? We know that um, a lot. And what happens when in the integrity of the hearing or vision is compromised? And then what can be done to ameliorate the effects of hearing or vision loss? So let's, let's take a look at the correlates of development, of human development. First, motor. We know we are motivated to navigate the environment because we see and hear others and objects, things that we are interested in, that shiny object over there, that person that we knew uh, that we know that's uh, over there. We want to go towards them. Um, we coordinate our movement experiences with our sight and hearing to create fuller understandings of the world. We go over and say, is that my Uncle Jerry? Or we go over and say, is that the, the my toy that I left over there that I would like to play with now? If you see, for deafblind children, we must address these things in, a, in different ways by bringing things in the environment to them, but yet having them exercise their, um, their want as well as their safety in movement. Sensory, our distant senses do provide us with information so that we can be aware of the present environment and anticipate what will occur. Um, the primary uh, avenues for learning in schools are visual, 60% uh, visual, 60 and 30% auditory actually. Um, and so if we don't see something in our environment um, and we don't hear it, we must be brought, the environment must be brought to us and we must have ways to anticipate what will occur in that environment. The cues that happen, it's, um, for some odd reason, my graduate students in class know that know when I'm wrapping up class because they're putting away their books and their laptops, etc. How are they doing that? They're looking around and saying, well, it's around 7:30. Dr. Petrov's lecture seems to be coming to an to an end. I see other people closing up their laptop. This must be the time. Uh, so they start doing that. That kind of information we need to give consistently to our deafblind children. Social emotional, the combined use of distance senses provide us with frequent opportunities to engage and to interact with others, as well as provide information critical to those interactions, right? This is my teacher. This is how I act with my teacher. There's my teacher. There's my uh, teaching assistant. There's my principal. There's my mom. There's my dad. There's my sister. Our sensory system assists in the development also of ourselves and our body image. We, um, we learn by looking at uh, our interaction with others who we are, that shapes who we are. Without the opportunity and frequent opportunities for, for deafblind children to have the same, same experiences, they very often have underdeveloped self-image or self or, or images of the self, which has drastic um, uh, effects on their social emotional status. S communication, sending and receiving messages must use or adapt with other sensory avenues such as touch if you're deafblind, at least at times.
And then cognition and learning. Our distant senses support incidental learning, a key concept, um, incidental learning, the things that no one directly teaches me, but I see from my interactions and what's happening uh, around me in, in my sensory environment. Or concept development, um, which we'll go over in a second. Um, and then mental imagery, um, you know, what you know, what does the mall feel like? I want to go to the mall. What is the imagery that it, it brings from my experiences there? And access to the scope and sequence of learning environments. These are all in, in need additional support for those who are deafblind. So let's switch a little bit. Um, now that we have defined that the sensory system and perceptions are critical to development and learning for all of us, right? Let's take a step back for a minute to understand who is deafblind, because it's not as easy and is not as clear as one may think and has evolved over time. A lot of times deafblind implies a total absence of vision and hearing, which only represents really a small percentage of deafblind individuals. There is no single profile for an individual who is deafblind. Each person is different and presents with different sensory capabilities, different cognitive disabilities, different personalities. Yet it is estimated that there's at least one to two deafblind people for every thousand individuals with disabilities. So, um, this is critical to know that deafblindness, although it is very diverse, is probably the lowest of all incidents of disabilities. One to two per thousand individuals with de with uh, disabilities have deaf blindness. There's an impact of that as well, being the lowest incidence, meaning there's less people who have the expertise and specialization that um, addresses the needs, the In total needs to the of kids question, who are deaf blind, which is the reason why we have deaf blind specialists or people um, there were so many other uh, conditions or people going who have, there, have experienced and have training in deaf blindness like you are going through right now. Tube. So there is a globally accepted definition of deaf blindness, which is important. And within this definition or maybe explanation. There are critical attributes that must be understood by all those who are providing support and education. And I'll pull them out as soon as I read to you these definitions, this definition. The term deaf blindness describes a condition that combines in varying degrees, both hearing and vision impairment. These two sensory impairments multiply and intensify the impact of each other which creates a complex disability, which is different and unique. Deafblind individuals are unable to use one sense to fully compensate for the impairment of the other sense. Therefore, they require services which are different from those designate, designed exclusively for people who are blind or people who are deaf. The specific effects on development and learning vary greatly among our, these individuals, according to their age, on site, when they, when they became deafblind, and the degree of vision and hearing loss. It's much different, right? Um, so what, what this is saying will further, will further explain a little better. Well, one, that deafblind does refer to a degree of loss in both vision and hearing, but it affects the individual's access to the environment and learning and others. At nauseum, we have already went over this and I will go over it again and again, how important the word access is, providing children with at least equal access if possible. Yet the history of the term deafblind has a pretty, uh, pretty complicated history as we learned to, um, to understand who these students, individuals were. The term deafblindness has evolved over the past 50 years and has included such terms as dual sensory impairment, multiple multi-disabled with sensory loss, combined vision and hearing, co-occurring sensory loss, or multiple sensory impairment. 
However, these are no longer the preferred way of look of of defining or or labeling or identifying deaf blindness. There then after these was the term deaf blind. However, deaf blind people themselves said, um, "We don't like that hyphen because that that it, that indicates that these are that it, these are not one disability." So, so the field has accepted the um the term deaf blind or deaf blindness without any hyphen um let me give you an example to impress upon you the fact that deaf blindness is a unique and different disability than just deafness or blindness and that cannot and an analogy that may or may not work <laughs> um we know that if we combine if we combined blue like I'm doing right now, blue water, blue color with yellow, all of a sudden we get a different color. And that color, if you can see it, is green, is green. Now there's no way in the world I'm gonna pull that back out into, into blue or, um, or yellow. This is a new color, just like deafness plus blindness doesn't really equal deaf blindness. Um, probably should have a have that once you blend blue and yellow a new and much different color occurs green so okay so that's deaf blindness right um the same thing occurs when an individual has both deafness and blindness the combination is totally different disability deafness plus blindness does not really equal deaf blindness deaf blindness is separate all right so that word trouble is troublesome for for many parents troublesome for many teachers um people uh those who want to say well that he can hear or he can see um they have a lot of emotional as well as um as curiosity was why we're we calling them deaf blind so i asked three parents um families to address the following Remember back when your child was born and discovering that they present with challenges to their hearing and vision. In what ways did you process that information? Those of you who are who are parents in the in 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 this audience, um, you could think back the same as I asked these parents. And then when you first heard the word deaf blindness, what was your reaction? What questions did you have at the time? This is Pete, Maureen, and Kimberly. And I'm going to introduce uh, each one um, separately. So, and and I've asked them the same these same questions. Let's start with Pete. In response to the first question, when we first learned of our daughter's issues with hearing and vision, there were so many other conditions going on with her that those weren't the most critical. She had a tracheostomy and a feeding tube. So the hearing and vision weren't the most critical issues at the time. It was more so breathing and, um, and making sure she had enough oxygen. And re with regard to the second one, when they talked about deaf blindness, um, my reaction was that we are aware that she has hearing and vision issues, moderate hearing loss and colobomas and blind spots in her eyes. But, you know, she wasn't completely blind and she wasn't completely deaf. So we felt that, you know, in respect to deaf blindness, she's probably in a better state than a lot of others. And we knew they'd be impediments and how to address them, but it wasn't the end of the world. Thank you, Pete. Um, thank you so much, Pete, for sharing with us. So Pete, um, you know, Pete expressed how he addressed the deaf blindness let's let's go on to um to listening oh i'm sorry um let's go on to listening um to maureen remembering back to when your child was born and discovering that they present with challenges to their hearing and vision in what ways did you process that information uh 
I can say that uh, I knew very early on that Kathleen was going to have challenges. I think I was 12 weeks pregnant when I learned that she was not going to be typical um, for many weeks. And she was a full-term baby. Uh, there were different theories and, and ideas. But when she arrived, she presented nothing that anybody had prepared us for. Um, and I can say that in all honesty, after we went through a series of challenges in the NICU, she was getting ready to be discharged and uh, they did a hearing screening as the last step for discharge. And that was the first time that we were alerted that she was going to be hearing impaired. And that was, after all the challenges that we had gone through, that was, that was my moment of biggest panic because I knew that there wasn't going to be, or at least in my mind at that time, an effective treatment for that. And I thought that was, that was just what we were gonna have to live with. Everything else had improved for Kathleen, but I, I didn't see a way that that could improve after that initial screening. And the other very vivid memory early on I have of real terror, I guess, although that feels like a strong word now, was when we started early intervention and she was being screened to begin the early intervention program in our state, um, a woman from the Commission for the Blind came to evaluate Kathleen. And it was the first time that we heard the word um, deafblind. And I remember not what she said to me, but I remember her face and the way her face dropped when she heard that Kathleen was also hearing impaired in addition to being visually impaired. And I knew in that moment that that was bad. <laughs> um, that was me early on. I wish me today could go back to that mom uh, 12 years ago and say, don't believe any of that. Don't listen to any of that because Kath, my daughter uh, has um, uh, amazed me in so many ways and has refused any label, I think, including a deafblind label. Um, because if you read her file, you would think that she was not capable of anything. And she has proven again and again that she is capable of everything. And we're just so proud of her and all that she's accomplished. Uh, the second question is, when you first heard the term deaf blindness, what was your reaction? What questions did you have at that time? Well, I think I just told you my reaction <laughs> the first time I heard deaf blindness. Um, I had so many questions. I had no idea what that meant for, for um, my daughter, for our family, um, for me personally. Uh, I, I was working um, before I had Kathleen. I had assumed I would go back to working. I didn't know if that was going to be possible. I had no idea what that term meant. Uh, I think what I've learned what it means is it, um, it requires adaptation. It requires patience. Uh, that term requires understanding. It requires pushing back on preconceptions about what a child with deaf blindness um, can do and is capable of and how she should be treated and included and advocated for. Um, and uh, I think what I've learned is that it's a term not to be limited by, and that there are amazing people who can help um, children like my daughter achieve things that did not seem possible when I first heard that term. And uh, she's now, um, she continues to just amaze us with what she can do. And that includes reading sight words, uh, writing short stories, uh, doing all kinds of things that, again, I wish I could go back and tell the mom who first heard that term uh, not, to, not to worry so much because it was gonna be okay. 
thank you so much, Maureen. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and let's move on to um, to Kimberly. Hi, my name is Kimberly Tiedekin, and I am the mother of a very sweet, special, and sassy little guy named Thatcher. So I wanted to share two pieces of information with you for your prompts. Um, so the first prompt is just remembering back to when Thatcher was born and discovering that he presented with challenges to his hearing and to his vision. Um, in what ways did I process the information? I remember that like it was yesterday. Um, and I think I went through a couple of phases in processing it. My first one was just to kind of freak out. I, I freaked out because it was such a double whammy um, for us. We had a complicated story and the emotions were high. And then as you start to, uh, Thatcher had congenital CMD and that's what caused the damage to his vision and to his hearing. So as we're learning about all of these new challenges for him, I began to just become overwhelmed. Um, and I thought, oh my gosh, it's a double whammy, if not a triple whammy that he's got. What do I know? Who do I know that has deafness? Who do I know that has blindness? And my dad had RP. So I knew a little bit about working with folks, with people who have visual impairment, um, but this was just a very different element, different in that it is still in my family, but a different challenge. Um, one that he would you know, know growing up his whole life. Uh, and, and it was just tricky. So I allowed myself um, time to be overwhelmed, time to just sit down and cry for a while as I processed um, and rejuvenated so that I could gather some strength, strength that I knew would be needed to advocate for Thatcher. I have I work in the DEI space, so I have no problems going up against folks, but um, there's always a little more uh, sensitivity and strategy that needs to be put into it when you're advocating for your kids with people who will, will be around your child when you're not there. And I needed to just create my process around that. Um, and so after I allowed myself, you know, however many days I needed to, to be a puddle on the floor, um, while still going back and forth to, to the NICU, I picked myself up and just said, okay, like, what do you do, Kimberly? You put one foot in front of the other and you do this stuff. And so I started to gather some, some resource, resources. I asked questions. I made friends with other people who were in similar situations and just picked their brains. Some people will tell you that feedback is a gift and I think of it more as a buffet. You take the pieces that work for you and then you leave the pieces that don't or that you're not ready to eat yet. And hopefully they'll be on the buffet when you come back later. And so that's what I do. Every day I learn things that I don't know or things that I should have done differently for Thatcher, um, but I try to, to do my best uh, while still balancing all of the other elements of my life. And what I will tell you is that Thatcher knows that his mom will fight for him to no end. And Thatcher knows that he's loved and his teachers and therapists know that I will kick mediocrity out with no hesitation. And that's how I advocate for my kid. And that's my, proce my process for working through all of the information and continuing to challenge myself. So your second prompt, was when I first heard the term deaf blindness, what was my reaction and what questions did I have? Um, I think I was still stuck in that, oh my goodness, double whammy kind of phase. Like, we all know that when we hear about deafness and blindness, one person will tend to come to mind, um, Helen Keller. And I know that that is a unique story that we all have assumptions about and things that we think we know about, but we really don't know what it means. Um, so for me, it was, how can I do research? How can I let Thatcher write his own story? How can I challenge people not to lay their assumptions on Thatcher? Um, and then how can I provide resources for myself, but also for those who might think that they know what it means to be deaf and blind, or to those that may dismiss part of what Thatcher might need because they think his hearing is good or they don't understand the impact of his vision. Um, so I know that there's a lot to be learned and a lot that I won't understand and that I, that Thatcher can't even tell me until maybe he gets older, maybe. Um, but my, the, the questions that I had were just, how do I support my kid and who do I go to, 
to get that information and that knowledge. Um, and those are the questions that I continue to ask myself because I believe that in every situation we're the student and the teacher. In every situation, we are both the student and the teacher. And because there's so much more than any of us will know, the best thing that we can do is ask questions and broaden our own awareness and challenge the way that we do things and the way that we do others while navigating with grace. I say grace, grace and boundaries, but also grace. And that's my process. Thanks for allowing me to share this information with you. Well, thank you. Big thank you to Pete, Maureen, and Kimberly. Um, I want to let you all know that um, when I ask them to record this, this these are unedited um, videos. I simply pose those two questions. So it's not my words coming out, but my Lord, I know that they, um, they kind of even have a much better uh, clarity when they're explaining deaf blindness uh, than, than I do. So um, I, I want to thank thank uh, thank them very much uh, for their generosity. Um, each one of those children um, that uh, Pete, Maureen, and Kimberly is just like every other child I know. Um, they were they're much different. So if only the face of deaf blindness was recognizable, it would be easy. Um, as Kimberly said, um, there are some well-known early deafblind leaders, Helen Keller, Sabina, Santilli, etc. Um, and these women were um, were uh, powerful in their own countries uh, to um, in their own countries to uh, pursue deafblind education and to make deafblind education available. But these were a long time ago. These are just a few, by the way, of impressive uh, women and men who were influential in making the world aware of the capabilities and needs of deafblind people. Today, most of our deafblind children and adults have additional challenges and require specialized support beyond Braille and sign language. Um, and we need to look at our, our, our kids in a much different light, much different light. Um, there's a diversity amongst our deafblind our, our deaf children. Uh, they're heterogeneous. They're all different than each other. Um, they have shared etiologies with other disabilities. Um, uh, and they require a broad range of specialized knowledge. Um, more than 90% of children with deaf blindness have additional disabilities or health problems that often keeps them from being recognized or addressed as deaf blind. Yet they are. That they are. Um, to illustrate that, um, we know that there are there are some categories of etiology here. There is um, heredity uh, and chromosomal uh, syndromes. There's prenatal congenital complications, postnatal non-congenital conditions, random trauma, or other circumstances. Um, they are often um, uh, referred to as these categories, uh, congenital deaf blindness, deaf blindness from birth, congenital deaf, adventitious blind, you're born deaf but become blind or visually impaired. Uh, when I use the word blind, I'm talking about visual impairment, the whole gamma. Um, congenital uh, blind and adventitiously deaf, somebody who is blind, who becomes hearing impaired or deaf. And then adventitiously deaf blind, someone who who was born hearing and sighted but becomes deaf blind, which we all often call uh, acquired deaf blindness. So we have all these combinations uh, of people that are in this pool called deaf blindness. So that kind of sums up a little bit about the definition of deaf blindness. But to really punch this idea and to once again hear from the from the voices of parents who have lived experiences um, in regards to their their sons and daughters, I'd like to introduce you to the box of deaf blindness. What you're about to see is a video made and narrated by a parent of a child with CHARGE syndrome and her family's journey to understanding. It um, can provide you with the insight into what many parents experience when they first hear the word deaf blindness, like we heard from those other three, and how it came to be that this parent made sense of who her child is. 
I want to thank Kimberly Lauder, Lauder, uh, the mother of Dylan, who gave us permission to use this video in this training. So without further ado, I'm going to sit back for a while and I'm going to allow you to um, to listen to this uh, this short video called Moving from the Basics of Deafblindness, uh, called the Box of Deafblindness. Would like to introduce you to the concept of the Box of Deafblindness. This is a visual model designed to help understand how to facilitate engaged learning with students who are deafblind. This model came out of my experience as a parent of a deafblind child. When Dylan was born, we knew he was completely deaf by the time he was five days old. Later tests would prove this was to be true. We also knew he had blind spots, these things called colobomas. What we didn't know was how well he was going to see with those colobomas. We were told to wait and see. So we began to parent Dylan as a deaf child with the vision loss and celebrated any indication at all that he could see. But then people started using this word deafblind. Deafblind created a horrible image in my mind of Dylan alone in a dark box, trapped, unreachable. Yes, I knew about Helen Keller and I knew that language and interaction were possible. But I also knew that Helen Keller had exposure to language before she lost her vision and hearing. How was I going to reach Dylan? How was I going to know him, what he thought, what he felt, what he believed, what he wanted? How was he going to know us? How was I going to let him know that everything was okay and that I loved him? Fortunately, that image of Dylan in a box, alone, trapped, dark, unreachable, did not last long. I quickly came to realize that Dylan was in a treasure box, his very own treasure box, a box that kept him safe and protected from the world. And I knew it was going to be up to Roy and I to figure out how to help Dylan come out of that box and engage with the world. Now when you think about it, we all have our own protective treasure boxes too. If you have a migraine, if you've had a stressful event, if you didn't get breakfast, if the traffic was bad on the way to work. Many things make us withdraw inside the treasure box. But on the other hand, there are certain environments that we know that we come out more easily, that we participate more fully in life around us. The same is true for the students that we work with. Now the box of deaf blindness is a model to help us learn how we can help our students become more fully engaged in life. What are the things that cause them to retreat into their protective box? And what are the things that help them come out and engage with the world? We start with the box. The box contains the essence of who Dylan is, his personality, his thoughts, his ideals, his experiences. There's a lid on top of the box, and it's sealed shut, and I don't see a key. Intuitively, I knew Dylan had the key to open the box, and that I was going to have to enter his world so that he would be motivated and secure enough to use his key and to venture out into mine. But how was I going to enter his world without a key of my own? Where are the windows? Now off of this box come two arms and two legs, and there's two eyes, and a nose, and a mouth, and two ears. These are the windows into the brain. But in deaf blindness, these windows aren't fully open. Now let's look at Dylan's box. What are the windows into his brain? We know he has no hearing. Let's cross off the ears. No indication that he smells. We'll cross off the nose. Tube fed since he was two weeks old. Nonverbal. Let's put an arrow down to indicate those limited oral experiences. And then his eyes. He has those colobomas, those blind spots that involve the retina and the optic nerves. But there is some vision left. Let's see. On the right, he has some peripheral vision available. So the window's partially open there, 
and on the left, the macula is intact, so he has some central vision available there. But he also has some visual processing difficulties, so we'll put these little antennas with little squiggly lines on the top of his box to indicate that some of the information coming in is still not processed efficiently. Hmm. What other ways can we reach Dylan? His skin. Throughout his entire body, the box is covered in skin. And the box can move. We can interact and provide information through movement. And vibration. Providing input, rhythm, repetition. Also a way to provide information to the brain. Now you can imagine, with so many sensory channels closed, with such a lack of information, that the first advice we received was to provide Dylan sensory stimulation, to make sure we provided enough input to make up for this lack of information. But as discussed in the video on the brain, information that does not have meaning is perceived by the brain as stress. And what do you think is going to happen to the lid on the box with stress? That's right, the lid's going to close. It's going to close tight. And do you have the key to open the lid? No, the child does. Now each student is going to demonstrate that their lid is closed in different ways. The lid being closed simply means the child is not engaged for learning. You might see it through what we call behaviors. The child might start acting silly, might start throwing things, might run out of the classroom. Maybe they're perceived as underperforming academically. Or you might see the lid being closed through physical complaints. For Dylan, it's migraines. For other students, it might be seizures. Some students simply go to sleep. There's a song I particularly like, You Can't Make a Turtle Come Out, by Malvina Reynolds. She says, My little friend Noah has some pet turtles. He called them a gook. He discovered that you can't make a turtle come out. The more you make it, the more it won't. The same is true in deaf blindness. If your student has closed the lid, the more you try to force the lid open, the more likely the student is going to stay safe and secure and withdrawn in that box, or that they might flare up outside of the box. So if you can't force the lid open, what can you do? The first thing you have is your relationship. It's through the emotional security and connection that a student has with their communication partner that helps them feel that it's okay to come out. And then you might need to provide environmental supports. How do you structure the environment that makes the information available to them more accessible? For Dylan, it's things like blocking glare, shutting out the light and the reflection that's going to pull his attention away from the visual stimulus that you need him to focus on. It's going to be minimizing other distractions in the room. It may be some of the deafblind strategies that you use. For Dylan, we use a lot of hand-under-hand -hand support. It helps his eyes and the tactile system work together to provide more meaning to the information that he's receiving. There are other kinds of physical supports, a simple touch to his hips that help him feel grounded and secure so his eyes can work more steadily when he's working at the chalkboard or painting the box as seen in the picture. We have found that for Dylan, intervention is its own kind of key. It's the key that has provided individuals that understand how to form the relationship 
and how to use deafblind educational strategies in ways that allow Dylan to use his key and to come out and engage with the world. With intervention, Dylan is so engaged and independent. Without it, he's alone in a world of movement and visual stimulation. A world I call La La Land. Same individual, completely different levels of interaction and function. With intervention, you can help a deafblind student come out of their box and engage with the world. So thank you so much, Linda. The box of deaf blindness that when she notes about intervention, she's talking about personalized, individualized support, some uh, being provided by some trained uh, professional or paraprofessional, such as an intervener, which is a, a term of art uh, that we will address at another uh, time. Let me pull out some um, some critical understandings um, that will um, will add to um, what Linda said and what we've said so far. That deafness times blindness equals deaf blindness. It's really important. These are five areas that are important. I want to go through each one individually, um, starting uh, starting now. Early intervention is critical. The earlier we identify and provide appropriate support, the better. In fact, each day that goes by that an infant or toddler with deaf blindness is not provided the appropriate support and services, the less likely they are to develop optimal skills in learning. We must strive to identify early. This is not to say that older children cannot improve or learn. It is just better to have a good running start when the brain is the most accessible to change and development. Isolation of vulnerability is is uh, is something that well, the box of deaf blindness and Linda mentioned. Uh, the word isolate means to detach or separate, as to be alone. Okay, um, isolation by its very nature, when you're cut off from your sensory environment, um, you know, needs to needs to be. Um, addressed, so to speak. Um, the term vulnerable means to be susceptible to physical injury, attack, or criticism or something. Uh, many many parents are very concerned about the vulnerability of their, their children. Um, there are, and there are both their physical and emotional vulnerability. Um, I would say, how and why should we reduce the exclusion and isolation of, of children with deaf blindness and to assure their safety? Well, it is really critical. Here are some points to remember. Um, individuals who are deaf blind often have limited access to information, which may leave them in a position of extreme isolation. Let's provide them with that information. Communication partners play a vital role in reducing isolation and in helping the individual learn empathy for other perspectives and to interact more effectively. Isolation can be reduced by offering continuous communication access um, and access to the world, uh, enhancing the environment for the individual, and providing feedback about what others are doing and what else is happening in the environment. The better the interactions, the more often they will occur. Um, in terms of vulnerability, um, we must we must make sure the the child himself or herself feels less stress and 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 nurtured and trust in a trusting relationship to reduce their vulnerability. Communication competence, well, the only prerequisite to communication development is having people to communicate with and being in a social context. Every child communicates, regardless, maybe communicating in different ways. But when I hear a professional say the child doesn't communicate, I don't know what that means. Communication acts can be produced in a variety of modes or forms and should be. Prelinguistic uh, early communication forms, things that are not just words or symbols, must be acknowledged, supported, and developed and valued. Um, communication is critical, 
all forms of communication. When a child is first born, mother and father hear their cry and at five days old or 10 days old will run to the child and say, oh, they want to be picked up. Most likely, we don't know if they want to be picked up or they're hungry, but whatever the mother and father or caregiver does, that's going to reinforce that my cry will will be um, a symbol to someone to pick me up and I want to be picked up. They will learn. Communication systems must be initially developed and continually expand with a focus on expressive communication. So too much we put in, we put in, we put into the child without expecting their expressive communication. This happens often for kids with deaf blindness. The bond and trust between a child who is deaf blind and the communication partner should be understood, respected, and valued and earned. The, the way in which a communication partner approaches the child to initiate an interaction sets the tone for the entire interaction. The communication partner exerts great influence over a child who is deafblind, both physically and emotionally. And in order for an activity to have meaning and value for the child, there must be enough time to really understand and experience the activity. Review. Rehearse and review and rehearse again for memory. Self-stimulatory behavior, self-regulation. Uh, some children will uh, mouth things or hit themselves lightly. These kind of behaviors may be a child's way of ordering the world, or it may be a form of communication. I don't know. We can assume it's communication and reinforce it or give it an alternative. Building awareness and providing access. Well, to understand the learner who is deafblind, we must remember what we know about everybody, about all learners, right? All children um, are like little scientists. They use their senses to experience the world, to question it, and to look for constants in it, seeking for sameness. Incidental learning accounts for approximately 90% of these learning experience, at least for typical kids, right? We, we need to, to bring to the deafblind child opportunities for incidental learning. Young children seek repetition to learn concepts, and older children learn from exposure to new information and apply it to what they already know. These concepts and practices will be further explained in upcoming targeted uh, webinars. However, to begin now, access to the world is critical. So we must be as creative as possible to, to provide access to others, to peers, to family members, to schools, to the community members, etc. Deafblind children are no exception to these understandings. The deaf blind child is like a little scientist, however. He or she will require more deliberate in teaching and access. Um, his or her capacity for gathering information and experiencing the world depends on awareness and access. There's that word again. The capacity to learn incidentally depends on what is within sight, hearing, or physical reach. Access. For the most of us, vision and hearing serves to mediate the other sensor, sensory systems. However, for, deaf, for children who are deafblind, their developmental journey is unique. An example. So without sensory access, that journey is at risk of being fragmented or concepts are not developed appropriately. An example of a concept is a dog. Now, can we use two creatures both? Can these two creatures here be both dogs? What features do they both share that we can generalize this as they are both dogs? One is little, one is long, one is big. They're different colors. They, but they all have tails, fur, wet noses, barks, etc. It takes exposure to many varieties of dogs that develop your, our understanding of the concept of dog.
This goes for many other concepts. You can think of many others like trees, plants, cups, fish, concepts in which children generalize by, by seeing sufficient examples of them in their world. Seeing is a word I use or experiencing them. Individualized supports, and here in America, we call them interveners. Um, uh, our specialized considerations, approaches are critical and become the foundation for the development and education of children with deaf blindness. Most of these children require individualized supports to gain access to the world around them and to instruction we are trying to provide them. Um, the fact is access, access, access. How are we going to give access? So individualized supports for children with deaf blindness provide access to the learning and, and the living environment, okay? Making and maintaining social connections, developing communication, developing concepts, making curricular connections, being independent and safe. So I'd like at this point to review the beliefs and assumptions regarding the education of children with deaf blindness. I have I have repeated many many times the um, you know uh, some of these concepts, but let me put them all in one place for you as an as a summary. Children with deaf blindness can communicate and develop language. They can develop social relations. They can be independent and self determined. They can and self directed. They can gain knowledge and make progress in school environments. They can achieve high quality of life. They can contribute to their schools, homes, communities, and families. However, only the presumption of competence, the provision of individualized supports, and access to their learning environments need to be in place. Summary. Students who have a hearing and vision loss do not have access to the same amount and quality of information as are cited in hearing pairs, at least without appropriate and sufficient accommodations. Therefore, with appropriate mindset, advanced understandings and specialized supports, children who are deafblind will have improved access, but unfortunately not equal access to the amount or quality of information as they're cited in hearing pair, uh, peers. So I'd like to end, um, end here um, uh, with a quote from an Italian uh, deafblind woman, Sabina Satelli. Hand in hand, I feel the soul of others. I sense their feelings and I infer their character. She kind of sums it all up in, in, in one very simple statement. Well, I wanna thank you for listening to me today. And I assure you, and I would invite you to our future webinars that will take place in the next couple months. Um, in, included in that will be times in which we will have open um, web, open uh, webinar kind of sessions, a synchronous, so you can ask questions. And of course, if you have any questions or anything comes to mind, here is my name and my email. Please feel free to contact me um, at, at your leisure. Thank you again, and um, I will see you soon.